Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's 136. <laughs> We're going to get started again, resume. If we could shut the outer doors. Mr. Chairman. Yes, can you with, hold on just one second? <clears throat> For what purpose is the gentleman from Illinois? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Okay, I was just, let me just open it. All right. Uh, we're ready to take amendments. The gentleman's, uh, uh, the clerk will report the title. It's amendment number 15. An amendment offered by Mr. Rush. And uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Support of his uh, amendment. This amendment revokes the provisions of this act from going into effect until the EPA administrator, in consultation with the Secretary of Defense, certifies that the consequences of not regulating greenhouse gas emissions and its subsequent impact on climate change, including the potential to create sustained natural and humanitarian disasters and the ability to likely foster political instability where societal demands exceed the capacity for governments to cope do not jeopardize American security interests at home or abroad. Mr. Chairman, the overwhelming majority of respected scientists and scientific organizations worldwide, including the National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, all agree that man-made greenhouse gases do contribute to, to climate change, and these impacts can be mitigated through policy to curb these emissions. Mr. Chairman, just last week, a study by the National Academy of Science conducted at the re request of the U.S. Navy, concluded that climate change will pose a major challenge for the U.S. Navy in the emerging Arctic frontier. This report cited an increased demand for humanitarian aid as well as rising sea levels that could threaten low-lying low low naval bases as some of the challenges the Navy may face due to climate change. This report is just the latest in a series of reports conducted by the Defense Department, the intelligence community, and the Task Force uh, on Climate Change, which was created by the Navy to look at the effects of climate change on military forces. One of the most serious threat analysis was done by a dozen of the country's most respected admirals and generals in the 2007 CNA report entitled National Security and the Threat of Climate Change. In this study, these retired admirals and generals concluded that climate change poses a serious threat to American national security and that the national security consequences <coughs> of climate change should, fully be, should be fully integrated into national security, and national defense strategies. The report goes on to say that climate change, national security, and <coughs> energy independence all pose a, a rel related set of challenges for our military, and these threats should not be ignored or pushed down the road for future action. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, the meal before us today does exactly that. It pushes the challenge of regulating greenhouse gases which contribute to climate change down the road for further action at some later date somewhere down in the future. I do not believe that it is in America's best interest uh, to delay acting on these threats that we know are currently endangering not only our health but our way of life. So Mr. Chairman, I urge all of my colleagues to support this amendment so that, so that we are not ignoring the warnings from our most esteemed military men, 
our uh, those who are in charge of our national defense, and that we are proactive in promoting the threat of climate change before we are past the tipping point. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Are there other members wishing to speak on this amendment? Seeing none, uh, we're ready to prepare uh, to vote on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there other amendments? Mr. Chairman. Who, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from Utah has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the title of the yeah, amendment. One more, An amendment offered by Mr. Matheson. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman from Mr. Chairman, I have a perfecting amendment. Do you want me to offer it after the gentleman from Utah uh, describes his amendment or before? Is the gentleman, um, I would prefer that maybe the gentleman from New Hampshire offer his secondary amendment. That'd this one fine. first? So, that, so, we'll, so this will be an amendment to the amendment? That's correct. Can the clerk read and then circulate? The Bass Amendment. Amendment to the amendment offered by Mr. Matheson, offered by Mr. Bass. And without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and if that amendment to the amendment could be circulated. And I thank the chairman if I could. And the gentleman, the gentleman suspend just for one second here. And the gentleman from New Hampshire is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment to the underlying amendment offered by Mr. Matheson. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for uh, that. Uh, this amendment simply amends the last two lines of Mr. Matheson's amendment to further clarify the uh, words uh, policy that address this role. It substitutes the word policies that do not adversely affect the American economy, energy supplies, and employment. I urge adoption of this amendment and yield back. The gentleman will just suspend for a, a moment. I'll stop the clock because I don't think the amendments, okay. either one, have been have reached the dais. Well, I, if you want to start the clock again, I'll. No, no, it's okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll stop the clock. Maybe this is the time that I should have welcomed Mrs. Christensen and Mr. Walden back to the committee. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, could I? Yeah. Still here to introduce a former committee member who's uh, here today, uh, Greg Gansky. Are you I don't think he's here in the room. He was here a minute ago. Dr. Gansky, excuse me. Okay. All right. The uh, uh, the amendments uh, are now in place. Uh, is, are there any other members uh, willing to speak on uh, the amendment offered by Mr. Bass to the Matheson Amendment? Should I? Now, am I a member if of not, uh, let me, should we, oh, yeah, well, oh, speak on the Bass Amendment, go ahead. Gentleman from Utah is recognized speak, on the. I'd have you speak on my amendment. Do we need to vote on the second Yeah, amendment? well, let's, what I'd like to do is vote on the, the Bass Amendment first if there are no other members wishing to speak on that. If not, we will vote on the Bass Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me. Yes, gentleman from recognized. California. Uh, what I see happening is the Bass Amendment uh, would modify the Mathis Amendment say Congress should fulfill that role, that role is to develop a policy, but be sure that it, whatever policy they have it does not adversely affect the American economy, energy supplies, and employment. Uh, well, it may, it may affect some adversely and others more positively, but uh, I guess my question to Mr. Matheson is, he, does he object to Mr. Bass's Proposal. Uh, you know, I, I I don't object to Mr. Bass's proposal. I think that it's a this is a sense of Congress resolution. I understand these terms are not 
specifically defined, but I think that it, it's a reasonable sense of Congress, and so I'm comfortable with the Basque language. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if, if uh, Mr. Matheson is willing to accept the amendment, I, I, I Well, the gentleman from California yield for one second. Yeah, I would yeah, sure. say that the term adversely can be interpreted as one chooses to interpret that. It, it depends on who's involved. That's why the word was chosen. Okay, well, um, is I yield back, back his time, time? And I'm prepared to uh, right. vote. Uh, if no other member seeks time to speak on the Bass Amendment to the Matheson Amendment, we will consider the Bass Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The amendment as a secondary amendment to the Matheson Amendment is agreed to. And now uh, what I'd like to do is recognize Mr. Matheson for five minutes to speak in support of his amendment. Gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will not use all five minutes. I, I do want to just clarify one thing from, I, I, I filed two amendments for the subcommittee markup last week, neither of which I've offered today. Uh, one of them was dealing with the reporting language, which I still hope we can continue to have discussions about ways to gather information. I think information is powerful and important for everyone, and I want to continue to work on that. And secondly, um, during the subcommittee markup, I talked about an amendment that would address all the other regulations coming down the pike right now from EPA. Uh, I think an amendment that would help harmonize that process, analyze how they all fit together and look at the economic impacts of those re regulations would be helpful for consumers, for industry, for the regulators, for everyone. Uh, I plan on working that as a standalone piece of legislation. We determined through more discussions it wasn't appropriate as an amendment to this bill. This amendment today um, is pretty simple. We've been listening to a lot of discussion from both sides regarding the science behind climate change. Um, I think that climate change is happening. Um, I, I think that it's important that we uh, offer some sense of Congress that we acknowledge that uh, there, there is discussion of this in the, in, the, in the scientific community, that there is information that shows that things are changing. Um, this amendment really makes that point that it's changing and has global implications and that there's a U.S. policy role in trying to address the problem. So uh, for all the rhetoric we've had, perhaps this is one area where we can at least agree on some basic sense of Congress that there's an issue out there we ought to look at, and that's the purpose of this amendment. I appreciate uh, Mr. Bass's perfecting amendment, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. What other members would like to speak? Let me go to Mr. Bass, and then I'll come back to Mr. Waxman. Mr. Bass? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Five minutes. I need to strike the last word. I want to thank my friend from Utah for offering this amendment, and uh, I think it's important because I believe that climate change is real. It's a problem that needs to be addressed, and we need to develop practical, balanced, pragmatic solutions to reduce emissions, and at, while at the same time providing an element of certainty in our economy. I believe that the Congress should have the primary authority for doing this, not the Environmental Protection Agency. And my, it is my interpretation of H.R. 910 that it is, a, it is an effort to, to, to assure that that separation and that authority is maintained. I think to myself what it would be like if, we, uh, if, if, if there were other pieces of legislation that failed to make it through one Congress and then the agency with jurisdiction proceeded through what some would believe to be an appropriate uh, path and others not to implement a law whether or not it was passed. And so I hope that uh, we can work over the near and midterm to reauthorize the Clean Air Act in a bipartisan fashion. As the sponsor of a Clean Air Act reauthorization measure that was introduced by me and Senator Gregg and two uh, Democratic senators and a couple Democratic members of Congress back in 2005, which did, cont did include a carbon title, carbon dioxide title, I think it's important that we continue to, um, to address this issue and, and assure that at some future point, uh, the Congress will take up the issue of, uh, uh, of carbon dioxide and appropriate balanced uh, regulation of it, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair will recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, we had three amendments, and they were findings based on the overwhelming scientific consensus that has been presented from the experts. We had a proposal to say that um, that climate 
change was occurring. And that was defeated. We had an amendment saying that, uh, that it was caused by man-made activities. That was defeated. And we had another one that said, we uh, recognize that this, can, this is having an adverse effect on health. And that was defeated. Those were simply findings. They didn't change the bill. I know that was the argument was made that it changed the bill, but it didn't because the bill said EPA cannot do anything. So uh, now what we're going to have before us is something that's a lot less a scientific concern, and that in that concern we want uh, something done about it on an international basis. The U.S. has a role to play. Congress should develop a policy, but when you develop a policy, it shouldn't affect the American economy, energy supplies, and employment. Now, this is a state a, uh, statement of congressional intent. To me, it is about as meaningful as the resolution that was adopted after the repeal of the health care bill. Because after the repeal of the health care bill, we passed a proposal saying we want to do all these things that the health care bill did. We want to make sure people can get health care insurance even though they have pre-existing conditions. We want to stop the insurance company from discriminating and uh, uh, revoking policies when people get sick or putting limits on those policies. We want to cover the uninsured. So all of those things were a, a, a um, statement of the intent of Congress. Now we have another statement of the intent of Congress. Where's the beef? Where's the proposal? What is it that you would have us do? I agree we need to work on an international basis, but quite frankly, if, if every country worked together to solve this problem and lived up to their obligations, uh, in the Copenhagen Accord, that, that will be put us in the ballpark of addressing this problem. That means the U.S. must act. But the U.S. is not going to act unless we have an international action yeah. that we're, we're assured will not disadvantage any industry. Yeah. This is a good sense of Congress that I would define, I would equate to a noodle. It doesn't if you push a noodle forward, it doesn't, it doesn't move. What will move is when we have some ideas put on the table for accomplishing those goals. And those goals are exactly the goals that were rejected in the first three amendments. Now, I, I won't object, I won't vote again, I'll vote for this proposal. It's better than just saying the situation doesn't exist. If, if it, it, it exists enough to have scientific concern, all right, you at least get that. But the real test will be, what do you have to say about the problem? We tried to legislate, and there were no alternatives by the Republicans in the last Congress. We, uh, 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 the Supreme Court said EPA has jurisdiction, and they're trying to regulate. The answer by the Republicans is to stop that from happening. We thought there at least ought to be finding of what scientists already tell us is the situation, but we couldn't get that as part of the bill. Now, if we have a sense of Congress, if that's the best we can do, I, I find that somewhat lame, but better lame than nothing, I suppose. And I just want to point out that um, this is a sense of Congress. It's not a proposal, and it's attached to a bill that specifically rejects EPA's action rejects EPA scientific finding, rejects the ability of EPA to act even on motor vehicles and even in the tailored rule that they have proposed to only go after new sources that will be large emitters who can reduce their emissions simply by greater efficiency. And if that's not good enough, then we'll have a sense of Congress. But I, I, if, that's a, if this is a get well amendment, I, I think it's a little sick. It doesn't get us well. It just keeps us from dying. And let's hope we get some rebirth by some legislative proposal that you'll all come up with, other than just saying no to legislation, no to EPA, no to regulation, but 
no to the uh, problem existing, but yes, Congress should be concerned and maybe do something about it. Yield back my time. Chairman's time has expired. Are there other members wishing to speak on the Matheson as amended Mr. by Chairman. Bass Amendment? Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've got to remember we're not talking the general, a universal application of the issue of climate change. We're talking specifically of the, the proposals of the EPA to try to address it within their, their existing jurisdiction. And when I would, I would, I would prefer that this amendment have right on the top of it that there is no scientific um, evidence to show that EPA stated strategies will fulfill the goals of addressing climate change. Okay? Right up front. But that's, that's not what we have the vote on here. The fact is, the science it can be talked about on one side. Again, as I said before, there is no science and no testimony that we have received that the EPA is, is going to solve this problem with the implementation at a price tag, just of the EPA's price tag, of over $400 million. not talking about the others. And let me just make an editorial note. There was a reference to last year's effort or response to climate change crisis. In the words of Vern Ellers, who uh, I think we all respect him as a noted scientist, last year's proposal ha was long on taxes and, and short on caps. There wasn't, there wasn't a cap on emissions, there were taxes on emissions, and there was a whole different issue that we, when we talk about that. Mr. Chairman, if we were sitting up here as an air board, and EPA came before us with the proposals they did this last week, talking about how they were going to address emissions, there is not an air board in this country that would accept the EPA strategies as part of a SIP. There's nobody would accept the EPA strategy or their testimony as being reasonable if you were operating as a local air district. And I think those of us in Congress may want to take time to talk to those who've actually implemented these laws and understand that, number one, the law was never meant and never designed to address this kind of issue. Second, the standards that we're setting for and allowing the EPA to set are so low that no local air district would ever accept it from their own staff. And my attitude is that we set standards on local governments all over this country and we expect them to perform, but Congress in Washington re refuses to raise itself up to the same, same standards. And by accepting EPA and the testimony we received last, year, last week just really shows that basically the politics goes in front of the science, and for somebody to keep talking about one side ignores the science when they can't admit, they can't admit that, that both sides have ignored science on, on this issue coming and going, there is no moral high ground when it comes to the application of science on this issue, Mr. Chairman. But I think this amendment, even though it doesn't include a clarification that EPA can't um, fulfill the goals that they claim they're going after with their strategies, even if it doesn't point out there's no scientific data to prove their point or to justify their strategies, I will join with the gentleman from Utah and support his amendment. I yield. Well, will the gentleman yield before you yield back? I yield to the gentleman from California. Who I'm, oh, I'm the gentleman. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. We understand you have objections that this EPA rule will not solve this problem of climate change for the planet Earth for the next century. We understand you have concerns about that. So I guess I have a question. Have you or any other Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives ever introduced a bill that would solve that problem? And Mr. Could, could you he point us to it? Reclaiming my time, I have brought up item after after item that there are items in the previous efforts made last year that totally ignored the rational and identified answers to a lot of these issues, and that it included last year's proposal, included issues that, that scientists have known to be a problem for over 15 to 20 years. So trying to work with the last year's proposal, which may be the mistake this member made, thinking that there was really people that wanted to solve this problem and address it rather than trying to exploit it. And that's been my frustration with that. And I've been very happy to work with Democrats, Republicans, and independents across California at addressing air pollution crisis. But sadly, when you come to Washington, political agendas and hidden agendas seem to take a precedence over good science and sustained efforts at, at solving the problem. And I, I, and I hope to be able to work with the gentleman from both sides of the aisle to be able to address this issue. 
but to do it that solves the problem not moves other agendas and only only spends money and doesn't get to the goal and let me remind all of us unlike other environmental issues we're on a timeline here if we don't do the right thing enough quick enough we might as well just talk talk about mitigation of climate change rather than trying to avoid it now you'll back gentleman yields back are there other members wishing to speak on this amendment if not, the vote occurs on the Matheson as amended by Bass Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments? Mr. 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 Barton. Uh, strike direction of words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. This will be very brief. Mr. Chairman, I have a... Um, a letter from a physicist that I wanted to distribute. I've given it to the Republicans. Uh, it's a letter that was sent to Lisa Jackson by the retired head of the physics department at the University of Connecticut that, that talks about the science of global warming. And I'm told that Democrat staff has said that we have to get unanimous consent to distribute it to the Democrats. So I would ask unanimous consent if the uh, letter from profession, Professor Hayden could be submitted to the Democrats on the committee. Is there objection to uh, releasing the letter to the members on the Democratic side? If not, object. Um, so I without objection, back. the amendment or the, the letter can be distributed. Would recognize now uh, the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts to offer an amendment. Does it? I, I thank. The, I, I have an amendment at the desk. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Will report the title of the amendment. Marky 016. An amendment offered by Mr. Markey. And without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The, the staff will distribute the amendment, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. I, I thank the gentleman very much. My amendment is very simple. It says that the limitations imposed by the Republican legislation do not apply to any action EPA may currently take under the Clean Air Act that will reduce the demand for oil. In recent weeks, we have seen the people of Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya demanding democracy instead of dictators. But with this change comes uncertainty and instability in the region. And the shift in the political winds is now hitting American families in the wallets. At $3.55 per gallon nationally, gasoline is at, is at the highest price it has ever been at this time of the year. In 1985, we imported a quarter of our oil. Today, it is well above half of the oil that we import. And prices have quadrupled during that time. The hundreds of millions of dollars we send overseas to buy oil every day accounts for one half of the American trade deficit. Oil money supports Iran's nuclear program, roadside bombs in Iraq, rockets for Hezbollah and Hamas, and hate-filled Wahhabi teachings in Saudi Arabia. Historically, Fuel economy standards have been our most important weapon in reducing oil imports. As fuel efficiency went up between 1979 and 1985, oil imports fell from 8 million barrels per day to 4.2 million barrels of oil per day. As fuel efficiency standards stagnated, oil imports tripled between 1985 and 2005 to 12.5 million barrels per day. Now that President Obama has accelerated the implementation of language that I co-authored to increase fuel economy standards, we see that once again the dangerous trajectory of oil imports is coming down. In addition to making absurd claims about the impact that EPA's global warming authority will have, Republicans have also begun to assert that the legislation we are considering today will actually decrease gasoline prices. Of course, we know from the past month that the tighter global uh, demand for oil is uh, uh, dependent upon uh, geopolitical events uh, which are perceived to threaten uh, the continued supply, uh, and as a result, the gas prices go higher and higher. So let's look at our oil imports going into the future with and without EPA authority to reduce oil demand. If we preserve EPA's authority, to reduce greenhouse gases and reduce oil demand, we have a drop uh, in the uh, amount of uh, oil which we will import. As you can see 
uh, on the orange uh, dotted line. Imports fall from more than 9 million barrels per day today to less than 4 million barrels per day by 2030. That removes everything we currently import from OPEC. We import uh, approximately uh, 5 million barrels of oil a day from OPEC. We know that that will happen on the trajectory which the current law currently will take us. But the bill as written will prevent EPA from taking any steps to reduce our dangerous dependence on foreign oil. It puts America on the path indicated by the brown dotted line, uh, which is the Department of Energy's current baseline projection that assumes no further progress will be made. The Upton Imhoff bill, as written, opens up the existing car and light truck oil saving standard to legal challenge. This could add 500,000 barrels per day to our oil import tab. It removes EPA's authority to move forward with any future regulations that will have the effect of curbing oil use from cars or trucks. That could add up to 700,000 barrels of imported oil per day, per day by 2030. And it will prevent EPA from doing anything to reduce oil use from planes, trains, boats, or other industrial sources. That could add another 2.5 million barrels of imported oil per day. The Republicans are busily raising the specter of the Clean Air Act's devastating economic impacts, despite reports showing that the Clean Air Act has historically led to increases in jobs and will provide $2 trillion in benefits in 2020. But Repu what, what Republicans are planning in order to address this fabricated threat will create a real threat, a real danger to our, our country, which is increasing imports from OPEC. The Upton import, uh, Imhoff bill in its current form will lead to massive increases uh, from the Middle East, more domestic oil demand for oil coupled with declining oil reserves and skyrocketing demand from China and India is a recipe for dramatic increases in gasoline prices. My amendment will solve this problem by ensuring that EPA can take action to reduce oil demand. I urge support for my amendment to increase our national and economic security. And I thank the chair and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, may I ask counsel a question? Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, my question would be is that if the administrator has the ability under their power to take such action as would reduce the demand for oil, does that mean that they would be forced, if I vote for this, they would be forced to issue more permits for mining coal and allow more drilling of natural gas? It would, it would not um, require them to do anything as far as additional supply. It's just related to reduced demand. I guess my question is, it says though that they could use any of their powers if such promulgation, action, or consideration would reduce the demand for oil. And I will add in the, the friendly comment back here, does that mean that we could use, that, that they would be then re required to do that for not only coal and natural gas, but also domestic oil? Uh, not necessarily for coal or domestic oil, it's just reduced demand for oil. Is, it's just prescriptive with respect to reduced demand for oil. So it, and to that point, it also natural gas, they would not have to evaluate it for that either. I guess I'm asking the opposite. If they evaluate it that it's going to reduce oil, wouldn't that force them to use other natural uh, resources such as coal and natural gas? Not necessarily. It could be associated with just an increase in the price of oil and therefore oil demand went down. All right. <laughs> so uh, if, if I might follow up then. So that could even include just anything to raise the price of oil, because it would then make the demand go down yes. by definition. I thank you. And I yield Mr. back Chairman. my time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from California. I think that's a misleading answer, because there are other ways to reduce the demand for oil, and that would be fuel efficiency in automobiles and motor vehicles, not, a higher, not necessarily a higher price for gasoline. All let, let me put it this way. The, the bill says EPA cannot act. That's what this bill is all about. The Markey Amendment said, oh, but EPA can act if it will reduce our 
use of oil. So we're ge leaving a little part of the uh, ability for EPA to take action. EPA has already taken action in establishing uh, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. It's already in effect and it's been successful. We are reducing our demand for oil because of the fuel efficiency standards. And we are importing less oil because of it as well. Now, um, EPA cannot oppose a tax. Is, is, am I right, Counselor? Can EPA oppose a, impose a tax on oil? Uh, no, not a tax. Okay, so w what you said before isn't quite accurate because there are other ways to reduce the demand for oil, which is within EPA's jurisdiction. Well, I guess now, that let, let me complete my uh, thoughts on this. Um, the bill before us takes away e EPA's ability to act. Chairman Upton said this bill is necessary because EPA's greenhouse gas requirements will increase gasoline prices. That was one of his main arguments against this bill. Well, I believe this bill will increase our dependence on foreign oil and increase the cost for consumers at the pump. So to be sure we don't do that, the Markey Amendment would say that EPA could act uh, on, uh, on common sense things like uh, fuel efficiency standards. The bill before us prevents EPA from acting in the future on fuel efficiency standards, and many of us believe it even goes so far as to put in jeopardy what they've already done. Uh, the Upton and off bill explicitly prohibits EPA from getting even more savings from model years after 2016. So instead of allowing EPA to work with industry, states, and environmental groups to develop standards for 2017 and beyond, the Upton and Inhofe bill strips EPA of this authority. Well, that's exactly the wrong approach. The bill also may actually threaten the existing 2012 to 2016 standards that everyone agreed on. Uh, the Republicans said they want to preserve those standards, and they tried to do that in the in the in the bill. But we don't think that uh, they've done it correctly. And simply put, the Clean Air Act requires EPA to make an, uh, the Upton and Inhofe bill repeals the necessary findings that would uh, accomplish this result. So uh, I think the Markey Amendment is needed if we want to do at least that part of the uh, activities that will lower gas pri uh, prices, lower gas prices, lower the because we're lowering the demand. If we don't lower the demand, and if there's less of a supply, as we are now seeing, guess what? The price goes up. So better to uh, accept the Barkey Amendment, reduce the demand for oil, and therefore reduce the price and help the American consumers. What they've done so far has been a great success. There's every reason to believe what they can, if we can hold on to that, we'll continue that success. And so I would urge members to support uh, the uh, Markey Amendment. It doesn't deal with coal. It doesn't deal with natural gas. Uh, and the stationary sources, it doesn't ha have an impact on stationary sources. It only deals with the uh, motor vehicle part of what is uh, causing uh, uh, the carbon emissions, the greenhouse gases, and allows EPA to act. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield back his time. As I yield to the gentleman from Kentucky, I would just say that the reason that this, you're right, this bill will, or uh, without this bill, you will lower the demand for energy. You will lower the demand for energy, in my view, because you're going to dramatically increase the cost. And that is not the way that I believe that we should be going, which will hurt the lower and middle income families more than any other. The letters that we have received from a multitude of different uh, organizations, whether it be the refiners or, or others, have indicated that without this legislation, the cost to produce that energy is going to get higher. And when it does, as we know, the demand has to drop because there are folks, families, and businesses that simply cannot afford the higher energy prices and they will go someplace else, particularly the businesses will go someplace else. And that's why I believe that this legislation is needed uh, so that we, c we will not allow those energy prices to go up and thus 
uh, um, help with with the uh, the energy supply Mr. for General, all Americans. I, before General, I yield, I want to yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One point that I would just like to make. Um, under our legislation, certainly NHTSA still has the authority to deal with the uh, greenhouse tailpipe standards, and we know that NHTSA can regulate in this area pursuant to the authority under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act that was passed some time ago. Uh, and our legislation, I might also add, does leave in effect the, the agreement between the automakers, EPA and administration, DOT, for the years 2012 through uh, 2016. And we always have this cost-benefit analysis standpoint because w a as you clean up the environment on auto emissions, for example, uh, one, one way we did that was boutique fuels, reformulated fuels. Well, every time you do that, you raise costs. And that's precisely what will happen with these greenhouse gas regulations proposed by EPA. We're going to raise costs throughout society because of the additional cost to meet the requirements. And when you do that, our economy, we become less competitive in the global marketplace, makes it more difficult to create jobs, and that is one of our focal points today is having a strong economy growing with, with jobs. And at this uh, time, I would yield to the gentleman from Illinois Thank you. I would I would speak out strongly against the Markey Amendment. Listen, um, again, this whole debate is about increasing the cost of energy for our country. A greenhouse gas rule raises the cost on any fossil fuel. I don't care if it's crude oil. I don't care if it's electricity generated by coal. I don't care if it's natural gas. When you price carbon, you add additional price to the cost of any energy. Uh, and if you want to talk about our reliance on imported crude oil, a great way to ease that is to go to a all the above energy strategy, which, which makes new crude oil available in the OCS and ANWR, et cetera, coal to liquid, oil sands from Canada, all these things which will be dramatically impacted by the imposition by the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases. So. Uh, if we want to move to energy security, decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, the, the number one major uh, obstacle is the EPA and greenhouse gas uh, regulation. And I'll yield back to my colleague from and, Kentucky. And I would yield balance my time to Mr. Scalise of Louisiana. Thank the gentleman from Kentucky for yield. And I'll ask counsel real quickly, just reading this amendment, uh, when they talk about the empowering, in essence, the EPA administrator, tasking the EPA administrator, with coming up with promulgating regulations uh, that would reduce emissions if the administrator determines that such promulgation will reduce demand for oil. Uh, if the EPA administrator determined that a regulation uh, would, for example, as we've had testimony on cap and trade and even some of these regulations run millions of jobs out of our country, the EPA administrator could show that those millions of people that no longer are driving to work would actually reduce the country's demand for oil. Is that did that, would that then empower the EPA administrator to force those promulgated rules that then increase the price of gasoline to, say, $10 a gallon, where you would be assured of running those jobs away and reducing the demand for oil because people couldn't afford to drive? That hypothetical could fit within this language. Well, maybe, and maybe that's the gentleman from Massachusetts's goal is to continue to see gas prices skyrocket even more. I know the EPA administrators made comments that even under cap and trade, the president said uh, energy prices would skyrocket. The EPA administrator says her regulations would actually be even more costly. So maybe their goal is to raise gas prices. Our goal is to stop these massive gas price hikes, to stop this evacuation of jobs out of our country. And this amendment clearly gives the EPA administrator the ability and the authority and the task of actually increasing the price of gasoline because that would reduce the demand. That's the ridiculous. Gentlemen, time the amendment, I yield back. Are there, are there other members wishing to speak? A uh, gentlelady from Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes. Chairman, I move to strike the requisite number of words. And I yield my time to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. I thank the gentlelady very much. Um, I want to explain in very plain language what the goal of the Markey Amendment is. Um, the goal of the Markey Amendment is the same goal that uh, President Kennedy had in 1961 when he told Khrushchev with Sputnik delivering a message of technological security, uh, security from the s 
from the, uh, 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 from the sky to the United States on a daily basis, that we were going to put a man on the moon in eight years and return him safely to the United States, um, and that we were not going to allow the Soviet Union to control the national security agenda of the planet. The, per the point of the Markey Amendment is um, that we are not going to tie the hands of the EPA to look at the ways in which we can improve the fuel efficiency of the vehicles which we drive, of the planes in, within which we fly, uh, to uh, look at the uh, boats that people um, use in our country, um, so that we are looking at every single way in which trains, planes, automobiles, trucks, ships in our country consume oil, and that we are going to invent our way. We are going to develop technologies that will make it possible for America to be more efficient, to work smarter and not harder in the consumption of energy by improving the technologies and the way in which they consume oil, and to tell OPEC that within the next 15 or 20 years, we're going to back out all of the oil which we consume uh, right now that is imported from OPEC. And we're going to tell them we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand. That is the point of this amendment, okay? That's it, plain and simple. There's not, it's not more complicated than that, that we're going to invent our way out of this in the same way that President Kennedy said, we're going to invent our way to superiority over the Soviet Union in eight years. We're going to do the same thing here. That's what this debate is all about. Now, if you believe that, uh, that uh, we can't do it, if you believe that our country is incapable of increasing from 25 to 35 miles per gallon this, the uh, auto efficiency uh, in our country, then fine, vote no. If you believe that we cannot go from 35 to 45 miles per gallon uh, over the next 20 years, fine, vote no. If you think that it's too big of an imposition on America to be able to invent those new technologies, vote no. If you think the same is true for the way in which planes and ships and trains consume oil, you vote no. If you think America can't do it, vote no. If you think that this technological giant, which is the United States of America, can't respond to the challenge of OPEC, of Al-Qaeda, you vote no. But just understand, in voting no, you are providing the funding for our enemies in the Middle East. You are providing the funding for those countries in the Middle East that without the United States would not be able to sell those five million barrels of oil to us. Just understand what the vote is about. I'll tell you what it's all about, quite simply. This is the national security issue. Yeah, they debate this issue in the Foreign Relations Committee. They debate this issue in the Armed Services Committee. We're the committee that sends the message to OPEC. We're the committee that makes them toss and turn at night as to whether or not we are going to put together a technological plan that basically breaks our dependence upon that imported oil from OPEC and exports that technology to countries all around the planet that will break their dependence upon imported oil and in turn break the back of OPEC and break the back of Al Qaeda. That's what this debate is all about, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to color it uh, in any other way, you be my guest. But I'll tell you what the intent of the Markey Amendment is. He's sick and tired for 36 years on this committee from the first oil spike through today of somehow or other not connecting it to every recession that we've had from 1973 to today. There's been an oil spike every single time for every recession. And every time a price of a barrel of oil goes up $10 a barrel, two to, uh, 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 two to three uh, tenths of a percent is then taken off of our GDP for that year. Every single time an oil spike is tied to the recession. And what is that recession tied to? It's tied to something that happens with OPEC. So if you want to pretend that there is no connection, you can vote no. But if you want to begin to control our economic, our, our uh, trade deficit, and most importantly, our national security, you vote yes on this amendment. Because it's going to challenge America to respond in the same way President Kennedy asked our country to respond in the 1960s to the Soviet Union and their threat to our national security. And that's all this is about. And I believe in America, and I believe in our technological genius and our people's ability, once they uh, receive a signal, to be able to accomplish this goal. It's as simple as that. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there other members wishing to comment on Mr. the Chairman. Gentleman from California, like Mr. Bill Bray, is recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me try to bring us back to a little reality. I think there's times we've worked together on both sides of the aisle. I was very proud to be the author of the bill that allowed consumers to be able to not only know their mileage, but also the emissions in their car, that sticker that sits next to the, um, the mileage. But let's, let's talk about the agency that we're sort of entrusting with our energy independence. They have maintained a CAFE standard for a fuel mixture that is not legal to be used in this country. The CAFE standard, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this committee addresses it, is a standard that has been outlawed for years. So the CAFE standard that American consumers are shown is not a real world standard. EPA has never even considered addressing that issue. The fact is EPA, we talked about the tailpipe standards, and granted that the measurement of a, a fuel efficiency is and, and mileage is based on carbon measurement at the, at the tailpipe. But 21 years ago, the best scientists in the world on clean air, California, abandoned the tailpipe standard. They, to, they told the world it was uh, obsolete and misleading and terrible to use as a measurement. But EPA continues to cling on to a measurement that has been proven false by science 21 years ago. And at the same time that EPA is quick to tell the private sector that it has to spend money, raise consumer products, and actually expend um, economic uh, effort to, to extend mileage, the same EPA has ignored the opportunity, as science have, scientists have identified in studies, to increase efficiency of uh, range of cars 22 percent while reducing the emissions of same management. The EPA ignored the fact that instead of going after government, instead of looking at making things more expensive, I mean going after private sector, they've ignored the fact that government is not doing its fair share. And I point out the fact that EPA still has not addressed the fact that we could be reducing 22 percent of our emissions and our fuel consumption if we would only make sure that states and local agencies started looking at um, traffic management as part of a fuel efficiency process. There's that much wasted traffic management going on in this country that EPA, the agency that you're saying is the answer to our fuel efficiency, has totally ignored on that. And I bring these issues up across the board, not to just to oppose this amendment, but to really try to say my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, if you really want to get it done, don't depend on EPA to do it. Let's bring these issues back before our committee and be brave enough to address the issue that the CAFE standard is antiquated, flawed, and inefficient that, they, that tailpipe emissions should be replaced with total emission standards, and the fact that traffic management and telling our cities, our counties, and our states, and our federal government that, that, that um, pollution needs to be addressed with our traffic management and um, fuel efficiency needs to be addressed, then and only then can we really start talking about the fact that we care as much as we do about air emissions and fuel efficiency. So again, I hope that we're able to defeat this amendment, but I hope we don't forget there's a whole lot of things that this committee hasn't done and uh, that needs to be done, and depending on EPA to pull it off is not substantiated either by science or by history, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are the other members wishing to speak on this amendment? If not, oh, Mr. Terry. I'll be very quick. Uh, but I do want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Markey for helping us uh, along in this debate. This amendment recognizes that uh, the EPA does not have authority to regulate uh, greenhouse gases, and this would offer, or in fact, uh, resolve that issue by giving them the legislative authority to regulate. Uh, so I appreciate the recognition that they don't have the authority now. Gentleman yields back. Are the other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on those on the amendment. Yes, the gentlelady from California. Mr. Chairman, I've tried to uh, be a, a diligent member and uh, not only participate. For five minutes. Thank you. Uh, to not only participate, but to listen uh, to the debate and all the amendments offered. I I'd like to ask the majority, and maybe the chairman can answer this on behalf of the majority. What is your plan? 
We know you're against the EPA. We know that you don't want any regulations relative to greenhouse gases. You don't believe in the science. Uh, we know all the things that you are against. But what is it, what is your plan for reducing America's addiction and dependence on foreign oil that is bad foreign policy, that is bad economic policy for our country, and it is very poor public health policy for our country. So maybe someone can articulate what you are for. Are you going to bring forward a, uh, uh, a broad and uh, 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 a full plan? Uh, what is it that you're for? We know what you're against. Tell us what you're for, and I'll yield back. Well, for me, I'd like to respond that I am for an all of the above plan. No, no, no. Uh, it's it's I, not about I, you uh, personally. I'm there, asking there, the majority. What are you for? What are you going to bring forward? I, I, well, he's trying to answer. I, I, I can say that, that for me, and you, you addressed the, the question to the chair, uh, I want to increase our supply. Uh, I believe that, as I said a few minutes ago, that I believe that this particular amendment, as it talks about uh, 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 when it specifically in line 11 refers to will reduce demand for oil, I believe that this, without this legislation, we will be reducing the demand for oil because we are going to be increasing the cost uh, to every consumer that's out there. Uh, this bill uh, prevents the EPA from regulating greenhouse gases, something that was specifically prohibited in the Clean Air Act uh, as, we, as the Congress debated that issue back in 1990. Uh, the Senate had the provision that would allow the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases, and the House rejected the, the Senate provision. Uh, the Senate receded to the House, and this was not then part of the 1990 uh, uh, Clean Air Act. Will the gentlelady yield to me? Is the chairman saying that without, without this legislation, are you saying that with this legislation, the prices will go down? No, I, I, this or the legislation will, go up? will prevent prices from going up and, and higher the, than they are today. Okay, how will that happen in the, in the situation with oil and gasoline? How will the prices not go up when we have the problems in the Middle East? We're seeing gas prices go up right now. What EPA is doing is very has not even gone into effect. You take away EPA's power, how are you going to keep the price of gasoline from going up if you don't reduce the demand? Can you uh, increase the supply uh, sufficiently? Will the gentleman yield with the Can you increase the supply sufficiently when the United States burns 25 percent of the world's oil resources? Well, the gentleman, we only have three yeah. percent. How do you how do you figure out well, as, how to reduce the demand? As the refiners testified. If you allow the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases, it will dramatically increase their costs, which obviously will then be passed along to every consumer that's out there. So, so the uh, the well, uh, I dispute the price that. But if you have no law at all, if you have this law passed, EPA stops from acting. How do you deal with the problem? That was the question that Mike well, asked. Well, the way that you deal with the problem is that you begin to look at the supply question, of which we've said no to just about everything out there. We've said no to further exploration in the Gulf. You look at the numbers that have been put out by the, by the Department of Energy, and we'll be hearing from the Secretary tomorrow, already that we, we know that just in the last four or five months, production in the Gulf has gone down by 250,000 barrels a day, and by the year 12, will be almost half a million barrels a day less than projected in 2009. We've known that Alaska, we've had a declining population every single, or a declining uh, production every single year for the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, we've seen giant swaths of uh, land off our coast uh, be put off limits. And I'm delighted that the president decided not to use SPRO uh, well, just as if, a, if the gentle consideration. Lady would yield to me further. Do you think there ought to be uh, Fuel, tighter fuel efficiency standards to reduce the amount of oil used by We cars. are seeing. We're, we don't touch the fuel economy standards from 12 to 16. You, but that's, that's I not dispute in this budget. that. I dispute that. But you also keep the EPA f from doing anything more. And in fact, council acknowledged in questioning that the only fuel efficiency standards that will continue are those under NHTSA and not under EPA. Isn't that correct, council? 
That would be right, and it would continue to regulate fuel efficiency right, as they which would mean a 30 percent drop in what we're now achieving. Well, as the our time, the gentlelady's time has expired, but I, I would just note that we continue to allow NHTSA to promulgate uh, the regulations as it relates, relates uh, to fuel economy. Anyway, the gentlelady's time has expired. Are there further members wishing to, to speak? Or can Mr. We Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, mood was striking. I'm going to this side, uh, Last Dr. Word. Gingrey is recognized for five minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regard to the gentlelady from California's question, and I think it sounded, at least from my perspective, well, what are you, uh, what is the majority trying to achieve with this bill? Well, obviously, uh, in my opinion, we are trying to disallow uh, an unelected uh, agency, uh, the EPA, from imposing uh, a cap and tax, cap and trade regime on the American people that could not pass muster, although it did in this, in this body, in this uh, uh, committee room under the uh, Democratic uh, majority in the 111th Congress. Uh, it died in the Senate uh, wisely. Uh, and so uh, uh, this endangerment uh, uh, determination by the EPA would give them uh, the ability to do the same thing uh, by a bunch of uh, uh, unelected uh, uh, bureaucrats. And, and that clear and simple, uh, we're not going to let that happen. That would raise the energy prices for the American family uh, at least $1,500 per year per family. Uh, in regard to what is our plan uh, beyond this, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the gentle lady uh, from California and others on the other side of the aisle, our plan has been and remains an all the above approach. Uh, the chairman just uh, indicated a number of these things. We have 420 trillion cubic feet of natural gas on the Outer Continental tw uh, Shelf, 80 billion barrels of petroleum in the Outer Continental Shelf, 16, 10 to 16 billion barrels of oil in Anwar, 2 trillion barrels of oil embedded in shale in the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, and what are we doing? Uh, we have uh, 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 the, the former majority's bill, energy bill, with Section 526 that says you can't go after uh, those 2 trillion barrels of oil if there's one scintilla increase in the carbon footprint in generating uh, and producing that petroleum so desperately needed by our Department of Defense and by our United States Air Force. So let me be very clear to my colleagues, this is an all of the above approach. Uh, the, every, every source that you want to suggest in that all of above ap approach has some problems. Uh, if, if you're talking about wind turbine, you got to worry about n noise and birds. If you're talking about solar panels, you've got to uh, worry about the massive amount of land that you would have to use to uh, put down those solar panels. Obviously, if you're talking about uh, petroleum and natural gas, you worry about carbon footprint. Of course you do. Uh, a nuclear power, we know what's going on in Japan. I don't have to elaborate on that, although I think uh, that uh, I would rather believe Edward Teller uh, than Jane Fonda in regard to the risk of nuclear power. Uh, I'm not a China syndrome believer. Uh, so I think, Mr. Chairman, uh, very clearly uh, we need an all of the above process, uh, policy, and that's what we stand for, and that's what's best for the Ameri American people and, uh, and globally to make this country depend independent from foreign sources of which now we receive uh, upwards of 50%. Uh, so I think that it's pretty clear what we're trying to achieve, and it's for the good of the American people, good for the economy, and good for jobs. I'd be glad to yield to uh, any of my friends on either side of the aisle or yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back the balance of his Mr. time. Chairman. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time to Mr. Markey. I thank the gentleman, and I'm only going to speak very briefly in order to say this. When I was a little boy, and uh, going to the Immaculate Conception Grammar School and then to Malden Catholic and Boston College and Boston College Law School, Catholic school every day for 20 years. I was taught from the time I was a little boy that Jesus, when he was uh, confronted with the problem of a dearth of food and, um, and drink, took five loaves and two fishes and was able to turn it into enough to feed 5,000 people. 
with 12 baskets left over. And I believe that. I believe Jesus did that. Um, however, the United States only has 2% of the world's oil reserves. And we consume 25% of the world's oil on a daily basis. And there's nothing, there's no theological free market belief. There's no geological reassessment that can change the amount of oil that is under the soil of the United States of America. It's 2%. So the question that we have for our committee, since we are the long-term planning committee for the national security of the United States, because oil is the single most important national security issue, is whether we're going to put together a plan for the fact that our population is going to go from 300 million to 400 million by the year 2050, and that those who are alive today will be consuming that 2 percent of the oil. What is the plan for those people? What are we going to put in place? And my argument is, with this amendment, is that we are going to look at the technologies which we consume. We are going to do so in a way that does not impact our economy, that actually makes us the technological giant which we are in this field. It reduces the amount of oil which we consume, consistent with the fact that we only have 2 percent of the oil in the, in the world, and it damages our national security and economic security to ignore that fact long term, and that we are the technology committee. We are the committee with jurisdiction over how efficient the buildings, the, the appliances, and the vehicles, and the boats, and the planes, and the trains which we use in our country to propel our economy. And if we ignore that issue, that efficiency issue, uh, then we do so at our long-term peril. And it's the people who are sitting here who are the National Security Committee for our country, because oil and OPEC in the Middle East is only going to rise like a mushroom cloud out of the Middle East as each decade goes by. Every one of us knows that. And we are the ones who have to respond. There is no theology here. It's geology that we are talking about. We only have 2 percent of the world's oil. Are we going to have a plan? And if we are going to have a plan, it has to be tied to how efficient the vehicles are that we drive in the long run. We can do more drilling in the short run, but in the end, we are putting straws in to find the remaining 2 percent of the world's oil reserves that we control. In the long run, long run we need a plan. And this committee, as it is presently debating this issue, is ignoring that reality. And I think we do so at our long-term national security and economic peril. And I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, I yield back to the gentleman. I think Mr. Gonzalez, do you want to use the yeah, balance I wanted, this time? To yield, yield oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Gen gentleman I thank the time. gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I, I just wanted to throw in a, uh, a fact here um, on the heels of, um, of uh, what our colleague, Mr. Markey, said. Uh, in fact, because of the standards that are in place in the U.S. today, um, uh, the, uh, our country will import almost 3 million barrels per day less in 2020 than we imported each day in 2007. So um, I wasn't facetious when I was saying, what is your plan? What exactly is your plan? I hear some bumper sticker things that I heard during campaigns, but I, I don't hear a serious plan coming out of a committee uh, whose uh, uh, very title is Energy and Commerce. They are inexplicably linked to one another, inexplicably, uh, inexplicably uh, linked to one another. And um, uh, on um, uh, Mr. Markey, uh, referring to our being a, uh, a national security um, uh, a committee, uh, I, I would remind my colleagues that Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn testified before the Environment and Public Works Committee uh, saying that in one year, quote, we sent $386 billion overseas to pay for oil, much of it going to nations that wish us harm. This is an unprecedented an unsustainable transfer of wealth to other nations, unquote. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from, I think we're ready to vote. Does the gentleman from Texas? Just two minutes, sir. Especially. Recognized for two minutes. I, being from Texas, I thought I'd get a little bit of special recognition when it comes to oil. Uh, I cannot support Mr. Markey's amendment 
even though i agree with mr markey that one way or another we need to start doing something about our dependency on foreign oil if you look at the amendment though it seems to stand for the proposition that as long as it somehow reduces demand for oil then it probably be adequate area for the e p a or good policy i don't agree with that the recognition is simple oil fossil fuel for the foreseeable future future is the transition fuel as we move into the renewables and the alternatives we're not going to be able to do without it so first to a certain extent i will agree with my republican colleagues we need more domestic production which obviously relieves some of the dependency on foreign oil but i also think we need to be honest with the american public that as far as dependency it does mitigate but as far as price it probably won't do anything a barrel of oil in saudi arabia or a barrel of oil in the united states domestically produced is set by global markets so you tell me how that reduces the price at the pump so let's be honest with the american people but i still believe what mr markey is attempting to achieve is something that needs to be achieved we cannot be dependent to the extent that we are on foreign sources for oil and efficiency and renewables and alternatives are all part of the mix but as an example now i voted for cap and trade i voted for our bill and i still believe it was a good bill and the senate didn't move on it and we're here today but do i actually believe that what we attempted to do previously and in our own bill has served us well when it comes to ethanol has anybody anybody been reading what's going on with our food supply in the world and out of the united states and that we now grow half of our corn crop as a fuel source how wise was that but did it reduce our dependency on foreign oil i would say that you probably could answer that in the affirmative was it good policy i'd say no so that's really the debate today and sitting here and listening through it all you would say we can't get there from here i would like to think that we can and with that uh, again i commend mr markey for his effort and and regret that i would not be able to support the amendment as worded thank you and i yield back gentlemen's uh, two minutes has expired i think we're ready for the vote um uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. No. Aye. No. Is, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Barton? Mr. Stearns? No. Mr. Stearns? No. Mr. Whitfield? No. Mr. Whitfield? No. Mr. Shimkus? Mr. Pitts? Mr. Pitts? No. Mrs. Bono Mac? Mrs. Bono Mac? No. Mr. Walden? No. Mr. Terry? Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers? Mrs. Myrick? No. Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Murphy? Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess? Mrs. Blackburn? Mrs. Blackburn, no. Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Bilbray, no. Mr. Bass? Mr. Bass, no. Mr. Gingry? Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise? Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Wada, Mr. Wada, no. Mrs. McMorris Rogers, Mr. Harper, Mr. Harper, no. Mr. Lance, Mr. Lance, no. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, no. Mr. Guthrie, Mr. Guthrie, no. Mr. Olson, Mr. Olson, no. Mr. McKinley, Mr. McKinley, no. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo, no. Mr. Kinzinger, Mr. Kinzinger, no. Mr. Griffith, Mr. Griffith, no. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle, Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Towns, Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Rush, Mrs. Eshoo, uh, aye. Mrs. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Deget? Ms. Deget, aye. Mrs. Caps? Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle? Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Schakowsky? Aye. 
Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin? Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner? Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson? Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield? Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow, no. Ms. Metsui? Ms. Metsui, aye. Ms. Christensen? Ms. Christensen, aye. Mr. Upton? No. Mr. Upton, no. Which members uh, still would like to vote? Mr. Barton? Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Shimkus? Rogers, no. Mr. Walden? Shimkus, no. I'm sorry. Mr. Shimkus? Did Mr. Walden vote? Mr. Walden, no. Further, uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers? Ms. McMorris Rogers, no. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. Towns, aye. And did you vote? Can. Did you vote? Are there other members wishing to vote? If not, the clerk will record, will report the, the tally. Clerk is ready. Mr. Chairman, 16 I, 34 nay. 16 ayes, 34 nay. The amendment is not agreed to. The chair would recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Joukowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like uh, unanimous consent to put a couple things in the, in the record. One is um, from the managing editor online of Scientific American who refers to the um, so-called poll that was done of its members, which in fact was an online poll open to the internet, not just to its subscribers, which uh, actually refutes entirely um, what Dr. Burgess had said about the opinion of Scientific American subscribers. In, in fact, what the, uh, the, the poll says and what this article says by the managing uh, editor is that um, it, it says that uh, the big problem was that the poll was skewed by visitors who clicked over from the well-known climate denier site, What's Up? With that, run by Anthony Watts, the site created a web page urging users to take the poll. So it was uh, skewed more than 30% of the people who replied were from, sent over from that uh, climate change denier uh, website. So they say Scientific American says they were horrified by co-opting the poll by uh, WhatsApp users. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to um, correct the record and if I could put this into the record. And the second document I'd like to put in is a poll, a bipartisan poll done by the American Lung Association by uh, Mike Vosian and Andrew Bauman of Greenberg, Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research and John McHenry and Dan Judy of Ayers McHenry and Associates, Republican and Democratic pollsters, um, that actually 75 percent of the, uh, the, the people who responded support the EPA setting tougher standards on specific air pollutants, including carbon dioxide. Um, this actually is a scientific poll. The other was a skewed poll. And so this is just information I would like to place into the record. Without objection, the, the uh, documentation will be put in the record. Are there further amendments to the bill? The chair would recognize the gentlelady from California. Mr. Chairman, I have an, I have an amendment at the yes. Clerk will <coughs> read the, the title. Amendment offered okay. by Mrs. Capps. And without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the staff will 
give the members uh, copies of the amendment. And the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the amendment is very short. It um, makes sure that the um, amendments made by this act uh, shall not apply until the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention determines that climate change is no longer a threat to public health. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in so many ways, our planet really is not healthy. In fact, I think you could make the case that it's very <coughs> sick. As the planet's health deteriorates, our health will also be affected in new ways. So we have a choice. We can take the medicine that can help heal the planet, or we can ignore the symptoms and suffer the consequences. Sadly, H.R. 910 continues to ignore the symptoms. And there is now plenty of evidence that carbon pollution creates a whole host of health risks. Heat waves lead to increased death and illness, hotter temperatures worsen smog, and carbon dioxide worsens pollen, both of which contribute to respiratory illnesses like asthma. Extreme storms affect health and infrastructure. Disease-borne insects ins illnesses can spread more widely. Drinking water can become increasingly contaminated. Water and flu food supply security is challenged, and there are large numbers of people around the world, as well as here in the United States, who need assistance after each environmental disaster. That's why, and these are expensive uh, costs to our, our society. That's why the nation's leading public health experts and organizations recognize carbon pollution as a serious health threat. That's why experts, and this bears weight on the, uh, test the poll that was just conduct conducted by the American Lung Association, uh, and the American Thoracic Society and the American Public Health Association. All of these uh, experts strongly oppose H.R. 910. They know this legislation would interfere with the EPA's ability to do its job and that it would undermine critical EPA programs that have helped prevent millions of cases of respiratory illnesses each year, very costly cases, hundreds and thousands of asthma attacks, even hundreds of thousands of premature deaths annually among Americans. Mr. Chairman, there are also huge economic benefits to be achieved by enforcing the Clean Air Act. A rigorous peer review analysis conducted by the EPA found that air quality improvements will save $2 trillion by 2020, exceeding any cost by more than 30 to 1. Mr. Chairman, this is our chance to align ourselves with the public health professionals, with academic researchers, with medical practitioners, all who have concluded that climate change will negatively influence health. According to the latest assessment from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States, I quote, climate change poses <coughs> unique challenges to human health. There are direct health impacts. The consensus extends to our own CDC, whose former director, Dr. Julie Gerberding, testified, and I quote, climate change is anticipated to have a broad range of impacts on the health of Americans and the nation's public health infrastructure. More recently, Howard, Dr. Howard Frumpkin at the CDC, currently in testimony before Congress recently, stated emphatically that climate change is a public health threat. The path forward is clear. Protect the law that protects the public's health, and we can all reduce <coughs> health care costs and save lives. This is all jeopardized by H.R. 910, and so my amendment fixes the problem. It says the bill does not go to effect until the director of the CDC determines that climate change is no longer a threat to the public's health. I believe it's our duty here uh, in this committee to support the government's efforts to reduce people's exposure to harm. The climate crisis was caused by humans, and I believe we can solve it as well. We must address the root of the problem, Mr. Chairman, which means reducing the emissions that contribute to climate change. It's what EPA is doing. We should fully support them in fulfilling its responsibility. I know that doctors and nurses abide by the principle, first, do no harm. They are taught to advocate, above all, for the health of the patients in their care. I believe doing nothing on climate change is the same as doing harm. That's why we should adopt my amendment to protect the public's health from the dangers of climate change. And I Channel lady yields back. I know votes are being called on the House floor. I'd like to dispense with this amendment if we can before the before we have to leave for the multiple votes. Uh, are there members wishing to speak in support or opposition to the amendment? Seeing gentlelady lady from uh, Virgin Islands is recognized. In the interest of time, I just want to support the amendment. Uh, it's clear that the Clean Act, Air Act itself has saved lives and improved the health of uh, people living in this country, and, and the regulation of the greenhouse gases will do the same. I just want to speak in support. There are other, amendments, are there other uh, members wishing to speak 
If not, I will call the question. Those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. 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 No's appear to have it. The no's have it. The amendment is uh, not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the bill? The uh, Mr. Inslee, gentleman from Washington State, the clerk will report the title. Number 11. Number 11, and we will consider, we'll ask you to have some consent to consider the amendment as read, and when we return, as the vote's been called, we will, uh, we will, uh, gentlemen, be recognized for five minutes, but we'll uh, take a recess now until uh, five or ten minutes after the last vote on the House floor is completed. We have a couple of votes, I know, so when we come back, We'll deal with uh, Mr. Inslee's amendment. Stand adjourned.